Good job. Let's go right away. Yes. Good job. They're all so proud of you. So proud. Beast. <laughs> okay, so today's lecture is on anti ethics. How many people have heard anti ethics in a round? Wow. That's, that's amazing. Okay. So, uh, evidently, this position blew up. Uh, lots of people like it. Uh, for those of y'all who are in the top two labs, you will receive it as part of the book because it's chapter five in the book. So I will explain this idea. Uh, I will explain how I came up with it, and I will speak a little bit about how I think it's being run uh, correctly slash incorrectly in rounds. Uh, your lab leader should have already given you a short blog piece that was sent around. Did everybody get that? Yes, yes, yes. Excellent. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes. It's a blog. It's literally like 1,200 words. So we'll take a little bit of time to read that. Evidently, that's the only negative that people have against any of the evidence that I've written, despite the fact that I've written four books in 60 yards, because people haven't seen to be able to find arguments against me. So they make racist statements. So we'll deal with that as well. All right. Uh, so let's start off. Uh, Anti-ethics is a view, or more accurately, a paradigm, that has its basis in the deaths of black people, specifically <coughs> the deaths faced by black men and boys. So I ask, to what end can hope serve for the oppressed if the ultimate end of racism is death? Can hope ever be justified in a white supremacist society that murders blacks to maintain its social order? Now, as we talked about yesterday, you can see that this certainly resonates with what we've been talking about, Afro-pessimism, critical race theory. The reason that I believe these questions are different is because I'm trying to get at normative values, and I'll explain what that means in a second. Anti-ethics is an attempt to criticize normative values. My claim is that when we ask the should or ought question, what should we do? What ought we do? That the process of ethical deliberation fundamentally excludes the black subject. And here we talk about universalized ethics. So we're talking about from groups of people. What should rational individuals do? Like Kant's categorical imperative. The problem with ethics constructed as such under, under racism is that universal actions exclude the particular needs of the oppressed. The second reason this is a problem is because questions about ethics that revolve around the should Apply a kind of futurity that are not available to people whose lives are extinguished by racism and oppression. So for those of you who read the piece, I'm actually about to take it down from academia because it's supposed to book now. Uh, I say traditionally we have taken ethics to be, as Henry Sidwick claims, any rational procedure by which we determine what individual human beings ought or what is right for them or to seek to realize by voluntary action. This rational procedure, however, is at odds with the empirical reality with which the ethical deliberation must concern itself. To argue, as is often done, that the government, its citizens, or white people should act justly assumes that the possibility of how they could act in fact defines their moral disposition. If a white person could possibly be not racist, it does not mean that the possibility of not being racist can be taken to mean that white people are not racist. 
In ethical deliberations dealing with the problem of racism, it is common practice to attribute to historically racist institutions and individuals universal moral qualities that have yet to be demonstrated. This abstraction for reality is what frames our ethical norms and allows us to maintain, despite history and evidence, that racist entities will act justly given the choice. Under such complexities, the only ethical deliberation concerning racism must be anti-ethical, or a judgment refusing to write morality onto immoral entities. So my position is that the process of ethical deliberation in many ways absolves the racist and the history of racism. So imagine a world where someone says that racism has been part of modernity, but let's talk about Kant's categorical imperative. So why does, the, why does Kant's categorical imperative somehow become separate from the modernity that you just described when it was birthed from modernity itself? Think of Rawls. How is it possible that we simply assert that the idealist metaphysics of the veil becomes completely extricated from the racism of the, of the, of the, of the whole or dominant society? What is it, what's the magical wand about ethics that somehow makes everything go away? That we can even talk about atrocities but the, and the people who commit the atrocities, but somehow ethical deliberations allow them to be better people. Why does, the re, why does reason, why does the mind become absolved of everything that the actual body of flesh has done simply because we say so? And this is an important point for the oppressed. So imagine what it was like in the civil rights movement. We're students fighting, fighting simply to be recognized as human beings, as, as, as fighting for equality. Having dogs sicked on them, police brutalizing them, water hoses turned on them. And yet the claim is, well, we can still appeal to the consciousness and ethics, the reason of the pre people who are brutalized. Does that make sense? So what is it about the reason that causes white people to act violently, that causes white people to lynch, kill, murder, rape, etc.? What suddenly turns that off once you say, we're appealing to their reason or their ethics? Right? This became a major problem for me. So I argue that ought are normative or ethical deliberations uh, implies a projected or futural act. The word ought commands a deliberate action to reasonably expect the world to be able to sustain or support it. For the oppressed racialized group, the dead black male, ought is not rational, but a repressive utterance. For the oppressed racialized thinker, the ethical provocation is an immediate confrontation with the impossibility of actually acting towards values such as freedom, liberty, humanity, and life, since none of these values can be achieved concretely for the black in a world controlled by and framed by the white. And this takes us back to our thought experiment about slavery. How do you hold, uphold the white world? And how does a slave simultaneously fight or achieve freedom? Would that look like burning down the plantation? Would it mean murdering the slave master, the mistress, and his or her children? Is this what freedom from slavery looks like? Because if we suggest, as we've done, that we can simply end slavery, then we see all kinds of forms of neo-slavery emerge, right? Jim Crow, the prison industrial complex, Trump, right? These are all various aspects that reassert the inferiority of black people. So what does freedom mean if the white world still exists. And I don't mean metaphysically the white world, I mean actual institutions like courts, like white people, etc. How do we contemplate ethical action and will it for bodies that don't even recognize the humanity of the people making the appeal? In other words, if you have black people like King saying, think of God, think of what we should do to fellow human beings, and you have a population of whites that reject the notion that blacks are human, what is the point of ethics in that instance? Because the provocation of saying we should be ethical, there should be universal rules, 
by which we decide morality becomes an affront to the actions of the people that you're confronting. White people reject black humanity. So what is it that ethics can do to bridge that gap? This is why I argue that the options for ethical actions are not ethical in and of themselves. They're merely the options the immortality of the races world will allow. And that's vastly important. So think about this. When the slave simply is emancipated, the institutions of slavery don't change. And this is why Du Bois said that we need an abolition of democracy, a democracy that completely changes and reorganizes the economy, structures, and histories that, that, that was left after emancipation. None of those institutions changed, did they? You can still go see plantations. You can go visit slave quarters. These are relics, but these things still have an industry and market today. So what does it mean for us to have a value like freedom? When freedom is not actually a true value, only what the world says you can have. So we'll give you voting rights. We'll give you property rights. But we'll still incarcerate you. Is that still freedom? When you look at freedom in the white world, freedom becomes all kinds of possibilities. Freedom becomes synonymous with colonization, new worlds. Robust individuality. So the white value creates the environment or geography, so to speak, which circumscribes the possibilities of black values. Said differently, black values can only go so far. They keep running into white values in the white world. Thus, the oppressed are forced to idealize their ethical positions eliminating the truth of their reality and peeling away the tyranny of white bodies so that as the oppressed, they can ideally imagine an if condition whereby they are allowed to engage racism from the perspective of if whites were moral and respected the humanity of blacks, then we could ethically engage in this behavior. Unfortunately, this ought constraint only forces black to co blacks to consciously recognize the futility of ethical engagement. Since it is in this ought deliberation that they recognize that their cognition of all values is not dependent on their moral aspirations for the world. Instead, their perceptions of the world and its white architects are what determine the will by the will of white supremacy to maintain virtue throughout all ethical calculations. So blacks are confronted with a cynical proposition that the alleged evil that asserts itself as the cause and reason for black death is ultimately good and needed to sustain the white world before it. In short, black ethical deliberation is censored so that it can engage moral questions only by asserting that whites are virtuous and hence capable of being ethically persuaded towards the right action. Hence, all questions, ethical questions about racism, white supremacy, and anti-blackness are not about how blacks think about the world, but about what possibility the world allows blacks to contemplate under the ideas of ethics. So even if black people decided that you literally have to burn it all down, you have to revolt and kill the oppressor, the slave master, the mistress, the child, the white world says that's, that's unethical. So how do any of the values or possibilities that black people see or other oppressed groups see as necessary for their liberation get described or thought within the realm of ethics for whites? Ask yourself this. Isn't it interesting that most of the things that black people do or most oppressed groups have done have been claimed to be unethical by modern philosophy. So Martin Luther King could un oh, disobey laws, unjust laws, he goes to prison. Martin Luther King's a hero. Yeah. 
The Black Panthers disobey unjust laws and arm themselves against the police who enforce unjust laws. They're terrorists. So what is it about our notions of ethics, the abstractions by which we decide morality, the things that are good or bad, that seemingly allow us to maintain on one hand that there are unjust laws, but the resistance to those laws should somehow preserve the structures and ideas of the society that house them. I've always found that pleasant. So under this philosophical anthropology, under ethics, blackness aspires to be part of what the world allows rather than the impossibility he or she is. So in ethical deliberations, the idea is that the should question allows white people and the white world to become virtuous. It is a practice that allows one to suggest that despite the evil in the world, whatever the product of the ethical deliberation, it will ultimately be good. And furthermore, that the person that you appeal to, the white individual that you appeal to, the white world that you appeal to, even when it's racist, even when it's genocidal, merely erred. They just made a mistake. That the actions of racism are not endemic to its character. That its character is filled with virtue and reason. The genocide, that was just a bad couple of a few hundred years, doesn't define the character of the white individual or the white race. Everybody got that? So how does ethics link to Western anthropology, or the problem of Western man? So these ethics, the ethics that resulted from this vitiated morality, right? because remember, I'm arguing that instead of ethics defining morality, that the whole condition of what we consider to be good, etc., frames ethics. That's why it becomes an empirical argument, or empirical test. Are not arbiters of oppression at all. There's an implicit appeal to a hierarchy of being that is both empirical and universal simultaneously. All man is superior to non-man. So when I say man, who am I talking about? The way you're a centric male. What are you saying? The way you're a centric male. Exactly. But not just male, male and female. Two non-man, right? Which would be everyone else. Hence, ethics emerges as the product of the, of the over-representation of Western man thinking itself, projecting itself onto the future. And I'll give you a really cool thought exp experiment about this. So when you have social contract theorists saying that, that everyone has a right to property, how does that notion project itself into the future? What happens to property? Down. It gets passed down. So think about this. When Locke made the argument that one can seize property, when the British came over to the United States, or if you're from Louisiana, the French, right, came over and they start divvying up property, did they do that just for their group right then at that time? No. So there was an anticipation, right, an aspirational goal that this property belongs to France and all French descendants to Britain and all British descendants, etc., right? So what is it about the value of property that has concretely articulated itself in social organization and inheritance? You see the point I'm making? That the value constructed sought to organize the world in such a way that the people who authored the value can benefit intergenerationally in the future. the relationship between this empirical reality and the universal value 
is what I argue Western anthropology does. It creates values that sustains its group or its race into the future. That's why I suggested these ethics, when theorized away from the material peculiarity of anti-blackness, not within its corporal limits, which basically says when you're looking at when you're looking at ethics away from just how white people benefit from them, uphold an, only an overdetermined virtue of whiteness. It's only white people who benefited from these universal values. They hold within them, so these values like freedom or property, etc., no delineation between good and bad. Only a puritanical call to reason to turn its attention toward the other that it created. This attention, however, relies on the perceptions and caricatures of black torment that appeal to white self-assuring imagining of themselves. So that even when confronted with racism and their, the, their role as whites, thinking about black people incarcerated within a racist society and dying, these whites can claim that their conceptualization of racism itself are intersectionally next to other injustices such as property, sexism, homophobia, makes them virtuous whites. Here's what I mean by this. Let's say that you convince white people for a moment to actually consider the history of racism. And then I say something like, you know, all white people in the 19th century were racist. And somebody says, well, what about suffrage? Wasn't that a good thing that came out of it? Right? What about capitalism? Isn't that a good thing that came out of it? We, what about America? So do you see how the impact of racism, the death, genocide, and enslavement of black people, becomes weighed against or sometimes even becomes a necessary condition for the other kinds of movements that white people value. So their ethical deliberation becomes a way to take away the force of the racism to say, well, yes, racism, but women's rights. Yes, racism, but capitalism. Yes, racism, but we have America. So how does it become virtuous for you to reject racism if the process of deliberation is to weigh racism and the evil and horrors that certain groups of people experience against your own interests? What makes that ethical? What makes that a moral deliberation? So even in ethics, when you claim an abstract calculus that gives you a certain moral product, you see that self-interest in the rationalization of the white world interrupts the force of the catastrophe and horror that black peoples and other oppressed groups have suffered. Does that make sense? You see, because we claim ethics to be this, this magical process where we get universal action and will. But then when we look at it, how we deliberate about it becomes little more than an exercise trying to justify the world that we value. So it's in the process of the appeal to are getting whites to recognize racist oppression that allows black death to continue unabated. Since it is the exact moment that whites are forced to engage racist problems in America, such as anti-black violence in American society, which animates a version of the justice system, the police state, the white citizenry, and the practice of American democracy itself, where the death of black criminals demons remains normal and justified by whites, is this kind of thinking about racism in which blacks allow whites to impose their own reality. And here's their maxim, that racism is not death or the end of ethical calculus or a moral evaluation itself, but ultimately a call for all moral liberal people in America to condemn racism as a practice. This call is not paramount, however. It is weighed next to other democratic values that preserve this great white society, security, safety, individuality, property, profit, and freedom. That is, the very values that have justified the doom of black bodies when concretized in a white supremacist republic known as America. So at best, ethical appeal encourages reformism. Does this make sense? 
Now, specifically, when I thought of anti-ethics, uh, I did this thinking of a black male subject. Why would I think of black males in anti-ethics? Like anti would um, like imply the opposite of ethics or how like current deliberation goes. So, I guess in the center of sort of all ethical theories is like uh, like the white Western man. So anti-ethics would be based in opposition to that. Okay. Okay. Kind of. Kind of. Where else? Uh, black males are probably, like, or they are the most oppressed, uh, at least like statistically. Okay. So well, what about their oppression interests me? What is what what compo what is what does odd imply? Uh, moral obligation. Futurity. What will somebody Futurity. say? Futurity, right? So then, why would I pick black males? They don't have maturity. Right, why not? Because the system was built to give, like the ethical systems were built to give white people maturity. Mm -hmm. And so when they seized the land and like took over, that they still passed that power down to generations. Right, but so why, do black, why are black males excluded from it? Yes. Well, I guess empirically, like life expectancy and things like that for black men are much lower. Right, right, because when I was thinking of this problem, right? You see, this is, this, is, this is one of the things that white people or white races are very good at, okay? White races project themselves into the future by oppressing their women. Because if you control the reproduction of your women, you can, you can be whatever kind of empire you want because there are always going to be more. Right? So if you look at Trump, how many people, any Trump voters here? Trump supporters? No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> I love the faces. Look, here's a question. How many people think Trump's racist? All right. How many people think Trump's a misogynist? Ethno-nationalist. Okay. Why would Trump then not want white women to get abortions? He wants them to have white children. Very good. And what does every ethno-nationalist empire require to project itself? Sure. So, like. Uh, children raised in the model of the sort of like racist, like like this was a Hitler youth thing. Like the Same men thing. Hitler youth were told to like be strong. The women in Hitler youth's job, uh, the girls who went to Hitler youth were all they were told was like the top ten ways to make a strong male baby. There you go. So, like, so we know then that ethno nationalist regimes try to reproduce themselves. So why would Hitler also Hitler? Trump. <laughs> so why would Trump also be against immigration? It introduces like non-white people that could impact like how many white babies are produced. Very good. Now, I want you to work. This, I want you to keep this idea. Keep this idea in your heads. Okay. Why would Trump then say that Mexican men were rapists? As a guest protection of the white women. Okay, so was it a race politic or a gender politic? Race. Both. What did you say? Race. Well, race because they wanted to keep the white males and the white people beaten. But he said that to the world, so what did it appeal to? Gender. You can't change your answer. Well, like, it appealed to gender, <laughs> but it was about race. Right, but why would that appeal to the gender concept of people in America? Other hand, other hand, other hand. Try to get people who've never gone. And all the hands went down. <laughs> Go ahead. Because, uh, well, like, A, there are a bunch of women who are voters. Mm -hmm. uh, and then B, the white men want to protect the white women. So mm -hmm. if he appeals to gender, then white men are going to think, like. But, then, but what were white women's investment in that? White women voted, voted for Trump, too. So what were their investment in? To protect themselves. Is it protecting themselves? For their children. Their children? What else? See, think about how colonies are built, right? Do, you, do white women walk around with no ideas in their head? Is that how we think of white women? I read white women all the time. I tell you, that's not what white women do. Okay? So what would be white women's investments in having reproductive rights taken away? Or a group of, a certain group of white women? What would they see their role in society in? Making children, right? You see, the way that we study history, 
We think that all feminism was liberal feminism. That is false. And you will cover that when we get to the lecture on it. Okay? But think about it. If you're trying to reproduce certain institutions and values, who do you target? Who are the first educators of children? Women. Women, right? So the very first feminists in the 1850s said that they were morally superior to men because they were the natural educators of children. In case you didn't know, lots of white women were against the right to vote. Why? They said if they got the right to vote, they would be voting twice. Why? Because they can just influence their husbands. Not the husbands. Oh, children. The children, right? They program how the men vote. So that's why when you read like really old stuff by white women, they talk about how they're the lawmakers of society. And the fear, like you can actually go back to Lily and read this, okay, is that if you put them in the public and gave them the right to vote, they would lose their natural morality which God gave them. Because now they would actually be criticized where in the home they get to dictate the morality of society unheard, untouched, unheard, unchallenged. Crazy, isn't it? Now, it's from this line of thinking that I start thinking about the relationship that black male death had to futurity. Because it was both that black males, because they die, don't have futurity as a subject. But it also meant, just like identifying the Mexican rapist, that black men were targeted so they would not have futurity. So that white society could. So black male death does two things. It both extinguishes the black male subject, but also enables the futurity of the white race uninterrupted. The same way that the idea of the, the bad hombre or Mexican rapists or Indian rapists or yellow peril and Asian rapists. Notice how every other non-white man throughout history has been deemed a rapist by white society. So I argue that black male death, and they were really upset about Asian men, so I will tell you about that in turn of century at some point. Black male death functions to enable the projection of the white race. Uh, do you think when ethno-nationalists, like when they're trying to perpetuate themselves, do you think that's uh, conscience or unconscious? Oh, it's absolutely conscious. Absolutely conscious. So if you start reading about what German women did during the Holocaust, they took this, that became feminism. And it's really interesting because they started identifying the right to vote as a Jewish phenomenon. You see the same thing that happened in the United States in the 19, right, you know, after women got the right to vote in the 1920s and 1930s. So white women said, hey, you know, like the first people, I actually posted it on my Facebook, I know some of you on my Facebook friends. So, you know, I actually found this and I was like, I can't believe this. White women, the first people to, to, to celebrate white women getting the right to vote was the Klan. Because they're like, now we can outvote everybody else. Right? I know, but it's crazy because we don't think of things this way, do we? We don't be like, yes, women's rights, go clan. Right? <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't think of history this way. Right? And we certainly don't think of white women generally as being active participants in it. So when the WKKK was making their, all their constitutions, they're like, yeah, we got this on lock now. We got white men, we got white women, we're going to destroy the Negro. And the whole time, the people that these people are targeting are black men because they were given the right of emancipation. And you're going to find out when we do the first section on, on um, feminism as backlash to black male emancipation, exactly what these white women were saying about black men's period time. So that's where I get the idea of focusing on the black male subject. Right? I'm looking at this kind of historical record of racial propagation. I'm looking at the dual participation of white men and white women. I'm looking at the function of death next to reproduction. And it seemed to make sense to me at the time. So that's why I say the murders of niggers are virtuous, they are just. Because the black male is injustice, the evil that stands against white civil virtues. Death invalidates the persuasiveness of morality, the embodied virtue of democratic citizens, because there will always be those who did not survive to enjoy the embrace of the transformed public. Their corpses are forgotten so that those who live can enjoy the illusion of futurity. So think about all the black people that died in the civil rights movement. Think of all the people like Trayvon Martin. Think of all the people like Michael Brown. All the black males that died. And look, now we get to pretend that we somehow made an advance. We've suggested in our new post-civil rights discourse, our intersexual epic, that those black men who died were not 
were not heroes at all. They were rather they were oppressed. Right? They did it for their own self-interest. They were patriarchs, or whatever name you want to call them at this point. Right? You, see, you see how, how, how black male death in this sense empowers the narrative. Because right? there is no resistance to the narrative of why we've all achieved progress. It just is. We're more democratic, multicultural, feminist, intersectional, right? We just we pick words, right? We look at all the ideas we have now, yet the world remains completely unchanged for, for, for groups of people. See, this is the illusion of futurity, that we're now participating in the ideas of white futures. And notice, notice, notice how post-racialism works. When they elected Obama, the argument wasn't America has been fundamentally transformed by X. The argument was, Look how advanced white people in American democracy are. Right? They were patting American democracy and white people on the back. Look, look how non-racist white people are. They voted for a black guy. You see, you see how that only perpetuates the idea of white virtue. It only anticipates and, and reifies the idea of American democratic superiority. The same thing that was asserted when it was challenged back in the Cold War. So that's why I conclude that anti-ethics is necessary to demystify the present concept of man. Because Western man is futural, it is projecting. It is an attempt to expose the assumed ethical orientation of reason, that reason somehow anticipates morality or can decide morality, as an essential anthropological quality of the human, the futural self, as an illusion and a strategy. It's precisely this alleged pessimism that allows a fundamental and axiomatic rupture between the humanity of blacks and the assertion that white existence is, in fact, the substance of the human. To accept the oppressor as is, the white life made, visible, made manifest within empire, is to transform the white bourgeois concept of the human as a godlike sovereign citizen to contingent, mortal, and other rule. The black male as an anti-futural entity resists the class mobility and assimilation that makes specific classes of the oppressed imitate and seek to stand alongside the oppressor. The black male is the polar opposite of white civilization. When you read the rest of the book, mostly because of the rapist, because he's been made death, terror, horror, etc. So his intimacy with death has bred a different eschatological calculus that enables him to struggle against oppression, to live within tyranny, and despite the seeming permanence of the repressive condition. So anti-ethics is the personality slash program that argues that the empirical world or the morals that are demonstrated by whites within a racist society are the products of their ethical deliberations and rational calculus. It is not their mistake. So an anti-ethical paradigm would both make a claim of empiricism and reject the ability of ethics to abstract white consciousness from the world. In other words, you don't get to pull white people above the world that they've created and they suddenly become good, virtuous, and rational. Any questions about that? Yes, sir. Going back to the morals and ethics, were these created to justify systems of racism, or were they created out of systems of racism? That's a great question. That's a great question. Uh, so when we think of morals, let me, let me make this thing. When we think of morals, we're just generally thinking of what's good and bad. Right? We assign values to those. Ethics is generally understood as kind of the calculus that gets us to morals which is why you decide what's good or bad through utilitarianism, right? You say, does this actually increase happiness, maximize happiness or not? If it maximizes happiness, then whatever you've done is a good, 
right? Uh, same thing with you know deontology. So, given that, it becomes a great question because the problems that are being pursued under civilization, right? This is Rousseau's worry that what we take to be morals and ethics become little more than rationalizations for us to continue the ills of civilization. So, in that sense, Rousseau would suggest that civilization birthed these problems. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, um, one could certainly, well, I mean, because ethics was a product of modernity, so I think ethics would have to be, be, be consequentialist, or a consequence of it. But on the other hand, where does the motivation come from? Right? Where does the motivation to create people into different races come from? And I think that this is the problem of modernity, that there is this taxonomy that guides the scientism of Europe. And from that scientism, you get a kind of vacating of other people's humanities that are not European. From behind an anti-ethical paradigm, would we be able to sort of create ethical systems as long as they weren't based on sort of the anthropology that is critiqued? Well, I mean, I think there'll be a question of the universalism, because my argument is that no universalism can ever work within a white supremacist society for the press. So, but you could have different moral ends, yes. Okay, so there is, uh, what kind of metrics would determine what is desirable behind an anti-ethical paradigm? Well, I think that if you're looking at a question like freedom, for instance, uh, the, the example of the slave, uh, it could be that the end justifies the means. It could be uh, that you decided that the slave, I mean, you take a David Walker perspective, that uh, behind the mask of slavery, the slave master certainly can't have humanity. Uh, you can create any kind of what we now call ethical or moral deliberation. The point being is that it does not involve the assumption of a capacity of reason and morality that's outside of what the world demonstrates. So it's holding the world's feet to the fire, for instance. You don't get to say that the world will simply be a better place if we imagine it to be so. So you're saying until we sort of uh, remove these systems of white supremacy, mm -hmm. no ethical claim is binding. Absolutely not, right? Because any ethical claim is just a reproduction of their own anthropology. Right. Like property, property for more white people. Freedom, freedom for more white people, right? These are all just extensions of their own anthropology. So you can refute those. You can engage in deliberations as the oppressed, but they're never going to be universal such that they involve other groups of people or, or, or the white people or dominant ruling classes of people. Because they're by default excluded from that because you're not human. So I, yeah. Sir. Um, so I understand that Kant's anthropology was extremely like incorrect and messed up. Why does that necessitate that current day ontologists' uh, anthropology is equally as incorrect? Well, Kant's deontology, well, his anthropology was messed up because of his involvement with creating the concept of race and inferiority. Yeah. Uh, I think the problem of deontology still runs into what we're talking about here. So if one says that we should pursue, um, oh, here's a great one. <laughs> Given what we know, everyone should vote against Trump the next election. Is that an action you can will for every single person in America? Yep. Right. Yes, right? Because you say that that would be a moral action given all the things that, that would happen. Okay? okay? How does that universal rule implicate other things like, let's say, um, people were upset with Trump, but if everyone votes against Trump, then um, the new Richard Spencer becomes president. All right? So you will that. And everyone says, yes, we can will this because it's not Trump. But then all the black, brown, the other people are like, but yeah, but if it's not Trump, but if it's Richard Spencer, he literally wants to eliminate all of the people of color. So here's the deliberation. White people are getting screwed over by Trump and black people. Richard Spencer would, up, would help protect white people, but screw over all the black people. How does one anticipate that will? How do you, how do you resolve those two conflicts in a white supremacist society? Because now it's not just about the goods. It's a question of all. But some people have always been excluded from the question of all. So you can say, well, we, we take a Rawls view, right? We, you know, well, we don't know who we're going to be, so everyone's equal. But does that really undo the structure of the world? Ethicists would say yes, because this is just this is the ideal capital, right? We're just pretending. We're we're playing the game. We're behind the veil. Right? So if everybody was equal, who do you vote for? But you see, the outcome if y'all were all equal, you still gotta deal with the problem of race. Because you only have two options. 
So do you do you then say, well, you sneak a little bit of utilitarianism in there? Well, there's more white people, so it would kind of be better for everyone. Or more people than not. And then someone would say, but it would violate the rights of these few people. Do we want to do that? But maybe it wouldn't be that bad if they accepted our assimilated ass. You see, all these deliberations of how we get to what the end product of is still requires us to both negate and operate within the effects of the world. It's never completely removed. We still value life, we still value some people over others, we still bring into the history of racism, right? We can't get rid of that. So then why claim that it's a pure deliberation when the effect of that deliberation ultimately will serve the same end as the majority of white people in their institutions, structures, and ideas? Stated differently, why have modern deontologists not ever concluded anything along the lines of what any of the black authors throughout history have ever concluded? Why have they not concluded that perhaps democracy should go? Capitalism should go. White people should go. How do you not get decolonization from the will of everyone? You see how, we, because it focuses on certain solutions to certain problems. See what I mean? Yeah. Well, I haven't modern deontologists concluded that colonialism is bad. I think a lot of them have, have they not? The unfairness of colonialism, yes. But they wouldn't justify, say, the decolonial project. Oh, just like everything that stems from colonialism, we should like set fire to. Right, or even okay. the abolishing democracy, which is something that Du Bois calls for, or even right. How do, how does this ethical capitalism not get us to many of the thoughts or programs that that oppress people of color? Right. I think the ontologists have certainly recognized the ills of the world. I'm not suggesting that. Right. Right. Unfairness and justice. That's kind of like a silly mechanism to address it. Yeah, it's just. I mean, how do you? Let's create a standard by which we can will better actions for everyone that no one will ever follow. Because it works against our self-interest. Right? That's the problem. Right? And I think that this is what non-ideal theory tries to get at uh, when you're doing things like the racial contract or epistemology uh, or the problem of race in epistemology. But it never takes into consideration the flaw of the European consciousness. Uh, even Mills frames this more as, as a problem of ignorance. I'm always asking the question, how is it ignorance when it just keeps getting the same thing wrong so many times as if it's right? Right? White people have never been like, look, I'm ignorant. Look, let's go liberate some black people. Right? That's never how it goes. It always ends up to be an ignorance that perpetuates systems of oppression. It's not contingent, it's deliberate. I don't see the point of calling those things ignorant. So do you think the anti-ethical paradigm would justify like non-ideal utilitarianism? Or like would deontology, like non-ideal deontology, or like what would it justify? Well, those things would be particular. They would never be universal. Right. right. So a deontological calculus would be the calculus of group X within condition X or condition Y. Right. Uh, whereas Kant is saying, you know, deontology is the process by which you deliberate something that you can will for all humans into, you know, perpetuity. So I think that would be the difference. Anti-ethics would say that everything has to be particular to the context that you're evaluating. Is that if you're in a racist or white supremacist society, if you're in a Nazi Germany, those things would define the basis by which ethical deliberations happen. Or what we now call ethical deliberations. Uh, so all of the questions about what metric would be used behind anti-ethics have led to sort of like a particularism standard, uh, mm -hmm. these kind of things. These seem very similar to uh, like a Deweyan theory of pragmatism. Sure. What sort of marks the distinction between that pragmatic approach, which I think Cornell West has written about a lot mm -hmm. as well, and uh, so obviously, we, one would say that that is part of this part and parcel of the white supremacist ethics. Yeah, that's exactly. And then behind the anti-ethical sort of stance, the same sort of particularism analysis, mm -hmm. pragmatic analysis, case by case basis, social structuring, the same mm -hmm. tenets of that sort of metric for evaluation and Dewey. Uh, well, Dewey, I think it differs in a few uh, important ways. Uh, one, Dewey is a democratic theorist, right. uh, so he believes that the condition by which we can understand and make deliberations within, is within a democratic context, not the case for anti-ethics. Uh, he also believes that there's an ever-expanding notion of the social self and knowledge and community. Uh, I think that works the exact opposite. For example, Dewey would suggest that the interaction of blacks and whites uh, civilize black people, change their habits, makes them better, right? Uh, I would argue the complete opposite, that the, civil, that the contact between blacks and whites and whites in a white society only lessens uh, you know, black groups or other oppressed minorities. Uh, and the other part is uh, Dewey's theory of cognition and habit. Uh, I don't believe that there's a process of inhibition. So Dewey believes that 
habits are built through certain reflexes and that you can interrupt and change habits by inhibiting others and uh, developing incentives for other behaviors. I don't think that that's the case with violence. Specifically, uh, in 1922, he writes this article on race friction where he suggests that racism is merely the product of economic tension uh, and kind of the, the natural ethnocentric uh, habits of groups of races to protect themselves. Uh, I don't think that that's offset by an intellectual product or habit change. Though there are other people in our field who argue otherwise, they've never been able to demonstrate that at, 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 any, at any point in history. It's at best a theory. Right? So I think anti-ethics would certainly run against it in those three ways. Yes, sir? Uh, so I guess a lot of times people are like, when people read a sort of colorblindness or an anti-ethics critique, they're like, well, your cards are about Kant being racist, and it, my authors are not Kant, they just talk about what Kant talks about. So would the... Okay. So like they're, just they're not they're, Kant, they're just Kantian? Yeah. So like, I guess the problem is not only with the actual person making the claim or the anthropology, but I guess the system of democratic deliberation right. itself. So would that sort of be the reason why, even if the chorus guard isn't Kant, she's still bad? Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, the problem I have is that people act like categories don't persist. Okay, so I'll give you a really good example. How many people think that there are rational individuals in the world? Okay, a few people. Okay, so here's so <clears throat> here's the here's the trick. When you appeal to a judge, what are you appealing to? Rationality, Rationality right? Yeah. So let's say I'm not Kantian. I still believe that there's a rational I that's autonomous to to make its own argument, right? So there are certain things about eyes, reason, self-interest, right? Ethos, emotion, pathos, right? All these things, which are all Aristotelian terms, by the way, right? all these things still somehow apply to individuals. Here's an even better example. How many people learned about ancient Greece when they learned about the development of philosophy? And how that is important to us as, as people in Western society, right? So what, what country are we in? What the fuck does Greece have to do with America? The point of the ethics that was created in Greece was that it would apply to exactly. America. So that same logic. Then why does Kantians? Why is it that Kantians and ethics and Kant's frames not apply to you now? See, well, you believe that you fundamentally inherited something from groups of people that lived millennia ago that have nothing to do with you that would actually repulse, actually hate you if they met you because they were completely ethnic. If you weren't Greek or inferior. But you believe you inherited something from their metaphysical baggage. That you believe that there is something about reason and philosophy and the gods and, and the powers of dialectic deliberation. And you believe that holds through millennia later. But somehow Kant's that are using Kant's words because they're Kantian, somehow these things become extricated. When it's about race, we just pull it away, it doesn't apply. Why? I think the structure of reason is marks a distinction between the two. That's What's the structure what would be the structure? It sort of, of justifies it. So I, I understand what you're saying, which is that like it was created by these people who hate us. So, like, why do we? Well, just said they would hate you. Yeah, yeah. yeah that uh, we like, why do we think we've inherited something from them? Mm -hmm. But just because like these philosophers put a name on it does not mean what they have described like is intrinsic to their racism. So, but, why, but my question is, why is racism? Because race is a category of thought for Kant. So why does racism become something you just cut off? from the eye, from the autonomy, from the will. What makes it a less, you say that you have, you import everything else that the Greeks have, your rational, your dialectical thinkers, your moral, your ethical, etc. So then why do you just pick the one category of race and say that does apply when we've got all this other race? Well, I think that sort of is exactly, uh, might, be, might be the point of these, the, uh, that these people are trying to make, which is that sort of, well, reason is just like the ability to decide between which desire one acts upon, right? Well, so, the reason has to be more than that, right? right. Well, it's sort of rational. But no, no, the eye, no, but I mean, Right, the eye. But why do you have an eye? There is something that is me that, like, well, according to the argument, there is something that is me that picks between which desire I right. have. Right, and the eye, and reason allows you to do what in the world? Act. Act. But do you act towards everything the same way? Well, no. Because no. I'm an eye, so I pick exactly. and choose. So is there one chair or are there multiple chairs in this room? Multiple. So the reason tells you that there are individuated chairs? Sure. Are this, is there one person or more than one person in this room? Okay, so if you have the concept of one, you have the concept of multiple, you have the concept of other, you have the concept of negation, which one person is not the other, why is that any different than race? That's the very basis of creating it. 
So why do you just get to cut it out of reason? See, there's no, there's no logic behind it. You I just say that you can't. Like, if one has reason, one would reason race. Yeah, individuation and otherness would be part of reason itself, yes. Why is that? Well, reasoning, why is context. reasoning the existence of the category of race the same it's just as a text reasoning time. racism? Well, the argument isn't that reasoning is racism. The argument is within these specific frames of how we reason, race has been a, a very important foundational part of it. So the argument is not that any reason, all reason forever would always be racist, just that within the paradigms of Kantianism and European thought, reason has tended to divide people into races, which is racist. Dividing people into races is a negative thing. Mm -hmm. The solution is definitely not like mass integration. But that's how European that is that is how Europe has seen these problems. We, that was like the lecture we had, like one of the first lectures we had was yeah. mass integration. It's not the solution. It's, I agree with you. But, the, but notice Europe created the problem and it believed that it's superior, so the solution was to assimilate everyone into us. Okay. Right? I mean it's it's just the problem of European metaphysics. Right? It's how they divvy up the world. So Everyone, take out your blog piece. Yeah. So evidently, this is the only negative argument that people could find. So take a moment to read this piece, and then we'll discuss. Two minutes left. Bless you.
One minute. What is the article about? Hands? Yes, sir. Uh, about how even, uh, I guess, uh, like a black feminist can internalize these ideas that black men are rapists, and even when like faced with the overwhelming evidence that they are wrong in their convictions, they still refuse to believe it. Exactly. What case was this about? It's the name of the gentleman. But Mr. Wilson, I believe. Mm -hmm. And what was the what was the details of the case that became an issue? Uh, like him and a couple of guys like were convicted of rape, like, like raping this girl and like having oral sex with another one. But they weren't convicted of rape, were they? No, not convicted, accused. Okay. And like they had the like, tapes of it, and when it went to trial, like only one of them got like a ten year sentence for sodomy, mm -hmm. and it wasn't on the rape case; it was on the oral sex one. Right. So when they couldn't convict these gentlemen of rape, they came back with a sodomy charge. And Mr. Wilson was sentenced to, I think, over 10 years. The Supreme Court came back and said this was cruel and unjust. They justified it because of the age disparity of two years. There were not Romeo and Juliet laws uh, in effect in this specific case. Do you know what Romeo and Juliet laws are? Right, so yeah, you're in high school, you prior. So if you're if you're dating someone, usually this is only enforced with with men. But if you're dating someone, you're in the same grade. Say you're you know you're both you're 15, she's 15, you're 16, but then you have a birthday, you turn 17. The idea is that Romeo and Juliet laws can't convict you for statutory rape because there's only a two year difference. So this is it's kind of the thing that tries to protect teenagers when they have sex between each other. In this case, it did not apply because he engaged in oral sex, which is considered sodomy with an underage woman. So what ends up happening is he gets out, they change the law, uh, and instead of us saying, wow, this is a bad law, because it was also used against homosexuals, as well as married people uh, in the state of Georgia well into the 1990s, Ms. McCauley, who writes What About Our Daughters, suggests that he got away with rape. Um, so I recently found out that there are people who suggest that this, rape, this article perpetuates rape culture. And this has now become a negative argument uh, against my work or whatever they interpret themselves to be doing. Uh, I think at any point that you would easily call an ethics challenge, because that's not what the article is about. I think, too, the other issue is that the article works against rape culture, because it's exposing the ways in which convictions and stereotypes uh, amongst black males uh, are utilized uh, to charge them with rape even though they're not convicted of it. I think there's an argument about uh, just kind of the way that we look at gender uh, when it applies to men and women, specifically because the woman in question is white. When you have time to read it more, even her mother uh, was like, she said that she consented. Right? The argument that Ms. McCauley made in the argument is that a 15-year-old can't consent. I was like, yeah, that's not exactly true. Because right, if it was just regular sex, it would have been no problem because it would have been covered under Romeo and Juliet law. So that's not exactly the correct interpretation there. That's not what the court decided with. Uh, the other thing here is, uh, from what I've seen of the shell, uh, there's an argument somehow that this relates to a tweet three years later. Uh, the tweet has nothing to do with this. It was a different <laughs> argument about Trayvon Martin. So I really, you know, I don't know where these people pull these things.
but I think I think the I think the takeaway from this, now that you have the actual article and you can decide how you or your coaches want to run it yourself, is that I think it's extremely disturbing um, for the popularization of one black scholar's thought uh, to be met not with actual engagement with anti-ethics or them trying to figure out how to deal with the argument, but to suggest that there's some racist connection between uh, a black male <coughs> full professor and the idea of a rapist. So uh, I think an ethics challenge would certainly be called for, given that you have the whole article. Uh, the other thing is that you see this is very much in line with what the article is actually talking about, right? That any black male, even when found innocent or having nothing to do with the idea of rape, uh, can still be accused of. It. So instead, like I said, instead of them actually formulating an argument, the argument is like, hey, black men are rapists. You believe it too, right? Uh, so yeah, I don't think that that's, I don't, I don't see that as being a very viable type of attack. And the other piece is, is the piece that they cut from the card uh, is talking about my questioning of how black feminists reacted to this case, specifically about how we construct the idea of the rape, et cetera. Uh, not a question of whether or not uh, Mr. Wilson uh, should have or should not have, you know, uh, been per prosecuted for, for whatever the state charge was. So I don't know, I don't know what their interpretation is. Other questions? Okay. So anti-ethics, generally speaking, um, has nothing to do with the with the Wilson article. But in case they run it against you, you understand the difference between it. You see what it's talking about. And it's not saying that anybody should get off for anything. It's just question assumptions. Uh, if you decide to run anti-ethics, uh, make sure that you run it from the most recent copy in the book and not the one from the internet because I'm about to take that down. All right. Yeah. Go.